Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here, and in this video, we will be talking about metabolic training specificity. In the last few videos, we've been talking all about the three energy systems of the body, the phosphagen system, the glycolytic system, and the oxidative systems. In this video, we are going to dive into how to program training so that you are specifically adapting to each of those training systems, depending on which one is the most specific to your event. Okay, let's dive right in. This info comes from chapter three of the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. The chapter is was written by Drs. Hera and Kramer. Okay, so the first thing to consider is the percent contribution from the anaerobic and aerobic systems during sustained efforts. Now this will help to inform the way that we program intervals and durations of efforts for our athletes. So uh, this is during sustained efforts in bicycle ergometry. So know that when you apply these numbers to other modes of exercise, it might not be a one-to-one -one correlation. However, it'll be pretty close. So when we look at the exercise intensity, so zero to five seconds, you can go at 100% intensity and the contribution of the anaerobic system will be very high, 96%. The aerobic system will only contribute about 4% to that. As we extend that sustained effort out to 30 seconds, you can really only sustain 55% of your max power output for that whole 30 seconds. And now we're shifting to 75% anaerobic and 25% aerobic. Out to one minute, the power output drops even further and we see it's about 50-50. So if we're thinking about running an event like the 400 meters, which takes about 60 seconds, you know, depending on if you're male or female, or if you're elite or high school levels, this event is going to be slightly more anaerobic than aerobic, but really they're pretty close, right? So if you're running 50 seconds for the 400, which is, you know, pretty darn fast, uh, you might be using quite a bit of aerobic contribution for your energy production. So although you're a sprinter, technically, you still have a sufficient contribution from aerobic mechanisms. Going out to 90 seconds, and that power output drops even further, and it's going to be primarily aerobic. And beyond that, the percent contribution from the aerobic system just increases and increases. Out to 200 seconds, you see it up at 78%. And farther than that, the trend would continue. Now, the key point from this table is that the use of appropriate exercise intensities and rest intervals allows us to more or less select a specific energy system to focus on during training, and this results in a more efficient and productive training regimen, especially for athletes whose events have very specific metabolic demands. Okay, so based on this table, let me go back to the table. If you have a shot putter that you're training, based on this, the shot put lasts somewhere between zero to five seconds. And so it's going to be performed at 100% power output. And it's a very highly anaerobic event. So if you're going to do some sort of interval training with a shot putter, well, maybe we should be specific to the shot put event and to the energy system that this shot putter relies upon, which is on the ATP stores and on the creatine phosphate system. Perhaps um, singles in the back squat, repeat singles at just under 80, 85%, so you can move the bar explosively and fast with decent rest in between is going to be a great training stimulus because we're training in that zero to five second range. Maybe we do singles, maybe we do doubles, and we just repeat that. Or maybe maybe the power snatch or something like that. Or maybe 10 meter sprint starts, maybe even five meter starts, or maybe even an explosive broad jump where you then rest in between it. If we think about something different, maybe a an 800 meter runner who's gonna be out here somewhere between 90 and 200 seconds. This athlete will be mostly aerobic, okay? And so we need some aerobic development. We also though need some anaerobic development. And so if we are thinking of conditioning their energy system for their event, well, we're going to want to focus on things that are 
primarily aerobic, but that have an anaerobic component. So maybe we're doing repeat 200s or repeat 400s where the rest is shortened to allow them to accumulate fatigue and to enter the next uh, repetition with an oxygen deficit to really tax those systems. But the speed has to be high enough, right? The intensity has to be high enough. They shouldn't probably uh, go on super long runs. 15 mile runs are not going to necessarily benefit an 800 meter runner. Now you could argue that some of the greatest 800 meter runners have also been amazing longer distance runners. That's for another time. The key point though is we can use tables like this to inform the design of our training plans so that we can ensure we're selecting the right energy system to train for our athletes. So I've mentioned interval training a few times. Interval training is important because it emphasizes certain bioenergetic adaptations for a more efficient energy transfer within metabolic pathways by using predetermined intervals of exercise and rest periods. So an interval is a single effort of some sort of exercise, whether it's running or swimming or biking or lifting, an interval is a single effort. And then you have a rest period and then you perform another interval. And these intervals are usually predetermined, right? So you might say to an athlete, go out and run eight by 200 meters on the track in 30 seconds per 200 with a 200 meter uh, walking recovery. So that athlete would go to the track, they would get on the line, they would run 200 meters in 30 seconds, and then they would walk the next 200 meters back to the start and do it all again. That would be an example of interval training. Now with interval training, much more training can be accomplished and at higher intensities. Because we're providing the athlete with rest, now they can hit that same interval again and again and again at the desired intensity. They'll get fatigued each time, but we're allowing their body to recover and replete some of these substrates. We're allowing EPOC to come down at least a little bit before they start the next interval, and therefore we can get a much higher volume of training at a higher intensity. Now, the textbook gives some loose guidelines for work to rest ratios for intervals, depending on the energy system that you want to stress. Now, I say loose guidelines because if you've been a coach for any number of years, you know that there are a variety of ways, of very creative ways to stress each of these energy systems. And it may fall outside of these guidelines here, but let's look at what the textbook says. So if you are wanting to train the phosphagen system, you better be training at 90 to 100% of your max power output. Typical exercise time is under 10 seconds, and you should have a lot of rest, 12 to 20 times as much rest as working during that interval training, right? So let's say you do a power snatch. It takes you one, one and a half seconds. Well, you should rest, well, not really 12 seconds. You should rest a minute or so before you go do another one, right? A lot more rest than work. If you're training the fast glycolysis system, typical exercise time, 15 to 30 seconds, I might say even pushing 30 seconds out to a minute, and you want, again, more rest than work, but not quite as much, maybe three to one or five to one uh, as far as resting compared to working. So if you run a 30 second interval and you want to be fully recovered for the next one, maybe give the athlete 90 seconds of rest. Getting into the fast glycolysis and oxidative system, these efforts will last around one to three minutes, and this is typically the amount of time you spend on an interval if you are trying to improve your VO2 max or to run at around that velocity that you're capable of for your VO2 max. And we typically want a one to three or one to four work to rest ratio. And then finally, for the oxidative system, these efforts will last longer than three minutes. Notice that the power output is going down with, is stepping down with each of these. And we can he have as little as one to one work to rest ratio. Now, again, these are just guidelines because in programming for distance runners, I've coached a lot of distance runners in my career, we often use incomplete rest during intervals where we kind of flip the paradigm on its head. Maybe you're running a mile and then you get 30 seconds rest or 90 seconds rest and then you go run another mile at the same pace, but the pace of those miles uh, are more in line with the oxidative system. So they're not all out, but they're maybe at 10K pace or half marathon pace, and we just get a short rest to break up the effort and extend the amount of good uh, quality volume that that athlete can do. So again, these are just 
guidelines. But the key point here is that as you want to train each of these energy systems, and you're getting progressively less intense from the phosphagen system down to the oxidative system, you can extend the interval time or the interval duration as you go from phosphagen down to oxidative, and the amount of rest and the work to rest ratio changes as well. So a couple more types of training to talk about. And the first is HIIT training or HIT training or high intensity interval training. This is where you have brief repeated bouts of a very high intensity exercise with intermittent recovery periods. And these recovery periods are short, shorter than the actual work periods. And this will elicit, and we've seen this in the, in the research, elicit cardiopulmonary, metabolic, and neuromuscular adaptations. Now, during HIIT training, you need to be sure that you accumulate enough duration and intensity during the active portions, during the high intensity intervals, such that you have at least several minutes above 90% of VO2 max. So what does this look like? This looks like, uh, this looks like training for one minute, let's say, at an intensity of 90% VO2 max or over, then you rest for maybe 30 seconds, and then you repeat it four times. That gives you four minutes of training above 90% VO2 max. You have an incomplete rest. So EPOC is going to be greater and greater at the end of each interval, and you'll, and you'll start each interval already pre-fatigued. Very hard style of training, but it can be very, very efficient at training the fast glycolytic and oxidative systems. Also, because intensity is high, you also will get some neuromuscular adaptations. Um, it's better at preserving strength, it's better at even increasing strength, perhaps in untrained individuals. And so it's just a very efficient style of training. Suggested work to rest ratios are one to one, maybe even two to one. So in the original Tabata paper where they looked at 20 seconds on and 10 seconds off, it was a two to one work to rest ratio. Now, some drawbacks of HIIT training one is that you can get adrenal fatigue if you're always doing this type of training. It's just very intense and hard to recover from. And it can also result in greater stress and risk of injury because the power output is just so, so high and you're getting so fatigued. So we should use it sparingly, but it is a great tool in the toolbox. Now we also have to talk about combination training. Combination training is when you add in aerobic endurance to the training of anaerobic athletes in order to enhance recovery. We should be careful with this, okay? So we should be careful sending our baseball players out on long runs, especially uh, when you're doing it in order to flush lactate or some something like that that's not exactly uh, founded on physiological evidence. We should be careful if we're sending our strength athletes out to do endurance type work because these could decrease their anaerobic performance capabilities they could result in conversion of type two muscle fibers down to more type one fibers, or um, they could at least reduce the size of and the, um, and the anaerobic enzyme capacity of type two or fast twitch muscle fibers. It can be a lot of impact on these larger athletes' joints. And in general, it's very unspecific to their training. So we wanna look at some other ways to stimulate aerobic endurance in our strength and power athletes. We do know that they need some of it, at least to recover from their high intensity bouts. So perhaps something like HIIT training would be better for them or training that is more specific to their sport that involves some sort of high power output and then a partial recovery before another high power output. So some other problems with combination training, it can reduce muscle gain, it can reduce maximum strength, and it can reduce speed and power related performance. So it's really just counterproductive for strength and power athletes to be doing aerobic endurance training. All right guys, thanks for checking out Metabolic Training Specificity with me. If you had any questions or comments, let me know down in the, com down in the comments section. In the next video, we're gonna start to look at the endocrine response to training. So until then, remember to move well, live well, and teach other people to do the same. Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here, and in this video, we are going to talk about metabolic... <clears throat> Can't talk. Ugh.